Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, we're going to give it one more minute just to let people trickle into the meeting, and then we'll start the presentation. Uh, if you have any trouble, I think you have a chat function called questions. Please uh, let me know audio or video. And to all our panelists, if you can mute yourself for now when we start the presentation, and then I'll let you know when it's time for the panel discussion and you can unmute and share your video. Great. Still got some people trickling in. Great. So we've resolved one minor technical issue. All right. Well, it looks like we've got quite a few people on. I think we'll let everybody continue to come in. Um, Josie, would you mind typing in the chat bar the note to everyone about how to fix audio issues? And I think yeah, we, thank you. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Make sure I've got control here. All right. So good morning. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm Audrey Partridge with Center for Energy and Environment. And today I'm going to talk to you about our recent study and report, Minnesota's Power Plant Communities, or Host Communities. That study, titled Minnesota's Power Plant Communities, An Uncertain Future, assessed the social and economic impacts of five power plants, all of which will be eligible for retirement over the next eight to 20 years across the six communities that host them. Those communities include the cities of Cohasset, Becker, Oak Park Heights, Monticello and Red Wing, as well as the Prairie Island Indian community. For the study, we used a combination of qualitative methods and quantitative data to paint a picture of what power plants mean to communities that host them and how communities are thinking about and planning for their eventual retirement of those plants. After I provide an overview to the study, we'll move into the main event, which is a panel discussion with representatives from each of the communities included in the study. That portion of the webinar will give you all a chance to hear directly from the communities and then ask your own questions as well. I wanna acknowledge that this study did include an assessment of the impact of power plant closures on workers, which included interviews with labor organizations that represent workers. For this webinar, however, we're gonna really try to focus in on communities and community impact. And we hope to follow up this discussion with a future discussion um, to do a deeper dive on worker issues. Now I wanna acknowledge and introduce my co-author, Brady Steiga, who you should be able to see here on your screen. Um, a huge thank you to Brady for all his hard work and great expertise he added to this study. Brady, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say hi and also instruct people on how they can ask questions um, to clarify throughout the presentation. Sure, Audrey, thanks for that introduction. Um, my name is Brady Stagoff, and I also have worked at CEE for about two to three years now. Um, and it was a great pleasure to work with Audrey on this study. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can enter it in the questions feature of GoToMeeting, um, and it should show up with your name and the question, and then I'll be able to respond to it. Um, if we're getting a lot of questions at certain times, I'm gonna do my best to answer them as quickly and as promptly as I can. Um, but I ask for everyone's patience because we're all kind of learning how to do this in this pandemic age. So thanks everyone. Yeah, and, and we can follow up with answers. If Brady's not able to get them to you immediately, we're gonna try to record all of those and follow up with people who didn't have their questions answered. Um, now, uh, and again, bear with us, we're all learning this webinar technology. 
but here we go. Uh, now a little bit about Center for Energy and Environment and the perspective that we bring to these issues. CEE is a Minnesota-based clean energy nonprofit with deep organizational expertise in energy efficiency and other clean energy solutions dating back more than 40 years. We employ over 160 people across a range of areas, which includes energy and technology research, community engagement and energy planning, energy and building improvement financing, energy efficiency programs and services, and clean energy policy advocacy. Our organizational mission, which underlies all the work we do in these areas, is to discover and deploy the most effective energy solutions that both strengthen the economy and improve the environment. Here's a quick preview of the webinar today. We'll first cover the study, what we did, why we did it, the power plants and communities that were included, key themes, and of course, findings and conclusions. And then we're gonna have a panel discussion with representatives from each of our host communities. And we'll also have our utilities standing by in case questions come in for them. First, a little bit about the study. The Minnesota Power Plant Community Study was made possible by a range of generous funders that you can see here on the slide. We also had a range of project partners who served on an advisory committee for the project, which included a representative from each of the six communities in the study, as well as representatives from Xcel Energy and Minnesota Power. A number of advisors and experts also contributed guidance and knowledge to this project. And finally, many community members, community leaders, and local government officials and staff who participated in interviews, provided informational data, um, and filled out surveys. So thank you to everyone that participated in this study. It is truly a group effort. Now, before I dive into the discussion of the study, I wanna set the context for why we did this study in the first place. Minnesota, like many states across the nation, is in the midst of a major transition in how we generate our electricity. Electric utilities in Minnesota are transitioning from a predominantly coal-fired generation fleet of large central plants to a more diverse and less carbon-intensive fleet with high levels of renewable energy resources supplemented by mostly natural gas-fired plants. For example, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, in 2011, about 53% of Minnesota's electricity came from coal-fired plants. By 2018, only about 37% of our electricity came from coal-fired plants. And that percentage continues to decline. This transition is being driven largely by changing economics. Large central plants, particularly coal-fired power plants, are increasingly not the most cost-effective option for generating energy. Another major factor is the age of our current generation fleet. Um, in the next 20 years, nearly all of the power plants responsible for the state's current electric generation are eligible for retirement. And finally, state, local, and corporate goals around greenhouse gas emissions reductions, as well as customers' expectations for cleaner energy options are accelerating the pace of this transition. Large power plants, however, don't just provide electricity for the state. They are also the economic engines of the communities in which they're located. They're often the largest employer and the largest single source of tax revenue for the communities that host them. So while there may be some good reasons to retire some number of Minnesota's existing power plants, Power plant communities are going to face real and complex challenges when those plants retire. So we, as a state, need to take a thoughtful, planful approach to addressing community impacts throughout this energy transition. And that's the reason we led this study, to document the social and economic impacts of the power plants on their communities and how communities are thinking about and preparing for the eventual retirements of these plants. We see that as the first step getting a a good understanding in helping to these communities to transition effectively. So the overall project or effort actually included two separate studies. For this webinar, we're going to focus on the CEE study. This study primarily relied on qualitative data from interviews and a community survey with some additional quantitative data we collected from communities, utilities, and experts. We worked really closely with representatives from the communities to scope the project, 
develop surveys, develop the interview questions, and then pull together interviewees and to adapt the study to include additional information and issues that communities identified. There's also a second report, which is based on analysis performed by the University of Colorado at Boulder Leeds School of Business. The University of Colorado at Boulder used an economic modeling software called REMI to quantify the direct and indirect dollar impacts of different retirement dates on communities and the state. So while I'm not going to get into the results of the University of Colorado work today, I do recommend for those interested in this topic that you read through that report as well. Um, it is posted on our host community study webpage at the address in, on this slide. And we can send that out. In fact, if someone would, wanted to, um, to shoot that out on the chat bar, that'd be awesome. So now back to the CE study um, and what went into that. We conducted over 50 interviews, or we conducted many interviews. We conducted interviews with over 50 individuals, and that included local, local government officials and staff, tribal council and staff, local business owners, nonprofit leaders, faith leaders, and other community leaders. We conducted an online survey that was targeted at the general community and received 51 responses across all our communities. And of course, we collected lots of data from cities, counties, school districts, and utilities. Additionally, with the help of the Coalition of Utility Cities, who really did most of the heavy lifting on this piece, we provided an overview and analysis of important state policies that will play a role in the community transition. We interviewed staff at the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development and reviewed existing programs and services available through these. And finally, we conducted a literature review and research case studies of power plant retirements in communities across the nation. Though these communities have a lot of differences from our Minnesota communities, they offer a lot of good lessons that we can glean from the experiences they went through. The research questions we strove to answer, what are the economic imp impacts of a plant closure? What are the social impacts of a plant closure? And finally, how are people thinking about plant closures and what steps are communities taking today? Now a little bit about the power plants and the communities we studied. The study included five different Minnesota power plants. There were two coal plants and two nuclear plants that are owned by Xcel Energy, and then one coal plant owned by Minnesota Power. So starting at the left top and moving right, we have the Allen S. King plant, the Sherbrooke County Generating Center, or SHRCO, the Boswell Energy Center, and then the bottom left is the Monticello Nuclear Plant, and bottom right is the Prairie Island Nuclear Plant. These plants are hosted by six different communities shown here. Cohasset is home to the Boswell Plant, Becker to the SHRCO Plant, Oak Park Heights, the King Plant, Monticello, the Monticello Nuclear Plant, and Red Wing and the Prairie Island Indian community to the Prairie Island nuclear plant. The Prairie Island plant has a unique situation. It is located closest to the Prairie Island Indian community on what was once reservation land, but is now a part of the city of Red Wing. So really both communities are host communities in this instance, but in different ways. For those who have read the report, you know that the host community story for the Prairie Island Indian community is really quite different from the typical host community or power plant story. We're lucky to have Heather Westra here today to speak to that story through a panel. But as I go through my presentation, keep in mind that the Prairie Island Indian community is different. They do not receive the typical benefits. Uh, they don't receive tax revenue and none of their members are employed to work in or on the plant. However, they do live very close to the nuclear plant and its stored fuel. Here's just a map of the plants and the communities included in the study. Most of the communities, as you can see, are clustered around the mid to southeastern part of the state within an hour or so of the Twin Cities metropolitan area, with one exception, Cohasset up in northern Minnesota on the Iron Range. Geography, of course, is a big factor in a community transition. Proximity to economic hubs and transportation corridors, regional industries and the local economy, 
And regional and local natural assets are all important for communities as they try to understand the impact of a plant retirement. And then also as they look to various strategies to aid in their transition during and after a plant retirement. This table gives you a sense of the size of communities in their respective counties. All the communities in this study are relatively small, the largest being Red Wing with a population of about 16,500, and the smallest being the Prairie Island Indian community with a population of just 200. Uh, they are located in counties with uh, populations that range from 250,000 people in the case of Washington County, all the way to Itasca County up north with only 45,000 people. This table provides you a little detail about the plants. As you can see, most of the plants are around 40 to 50 years old. The estimated retirement dates range from 2028 all the way up to 2040. And those are estimates because there's still a lot of uncertainty around these plants. The estimated dates here reflect approved or proposed retirements mostly. But in the case of Boswell, the year of or the estimated date is the year of full accounting depreciation or the accounting lifetime because there is no proposed or approved retirement date for the Boswell plant today. Over the next couple of years, Xcel Energy and Minnesota Power will go through the integrated resource planning process and that will provide some additional clarity on retirement dates for these plants. This table integrate, or indicates the contribution that plants make to communities' overall tax base. As you can see, the power plants that these communities host contribute significant amounts in tax revenues to the city, the county, and the local school districts. In several cases, power plant revenues make up over half of the city's overall tax base and about half of the school's tax base. A sudden and dramatic decrease in tax revenue is one of the most obvious and quantifiable issues that communities face. Power plant tax revenues provide a number of benefits to communities. Most obviously, power plant tax revenues allow for cities and counties to provide services to residents and businesses and maintain their infrastructure while keeping the tax burden for citizens and local businesses relatively low. The same goes for school districts. Tax revenue from the plant means that residents and other businesses pay less of the overall pie in terms of school districts operating expenses and capital expenses. Keeping taxes low for citizens and businesses has indirect benefits as well. It allows businesses and citizens to keep more of their income and use it in other things, including commerce with local businesses and support for local nonprofits, Additionally, it actually seems to increase citizens' willingness to support initiatives like school levies, infrastructure investments, and investments in human capital like parks, community centers, or daycare centers. As I noted before, the Prairie Island Indian community does not receive tax revenues from the Prairie Island nuclear plant. However, starting in 2003, the tribe started receiving an annual payment from Xcel Energy, which is used to purchase additional land off of Prairie Island. Many community members wanted to live on Prairie Island Indian community land, but didn't want to live on the island so close to the nuclear plant. So the community is purchasing land near but outside of the island to provide new housing options for members. The plant, however, even with that contribution is not a major source of revenue for the Prairie Island Indian community. Power plant tax revenues go to help out other communities throughout Minnesota as well. Minnesota has existing state policies and programs for how to distribute state and regional tax revenue among local governments and are important considerations for community, regional, and even state planning around retirements. These policies and programs are aimed at creating some consistency in infrastructure and services across the state with an attempt to somewhat even out um, access to services for the tax wealthy areas of the state and the more tax strapped areas of the state. It also aims to eliminate some of the intra regional competition for commercial and industrial tax base. The two big programs are local government aid or LGA and the fiscal disparities program. LGA is a general purpose aid that Minnesota's cities may receive annually based on their need. 
Most of the cities included in this study do not receive LGA because of the tax revenues that they receive from the plants they host. If power plants in the study were to retire, however, several of those communities would have an unmet revenue need and may become eligible for LGA. This, of course, would be helpful for those communities, but it will also have an impact on the overall financials of the LGA program. Minnesota also has two fiscal disparities programs, one for the Twin Cities metropolitan area and one for Minnesota's Iron Range. Oak Park Heights is within the Metropolitan Fiscal Disparities Program and Cohasset is within the Iron Range Fiscal Disparity Program. When the Boswell plant and the King plant retire, these communities may go from being significant contributors to the program to becoming recipients. And that would decrease the overall pool of funds for these programs. In fact, analysis provided by the Coalition of Utility Cities estimates that the closure of the Boswell plant could reduce revenue in the Iron Range Fiscal Disparities Program by about 14%. Power plants, of course, are also major employers, providing income and benefits to thousands of Minnesota families. And as you can see from this table, power plant jobs are well-paying jobs. The average annual salary for an employee of the power plants included in this study ranges from about $88,000 to $110,000 a year, while the average household income for Minnesota, and yes, I said household, not individual, is just over $68,000 a year. And these jobs are really high quality aside from just pay. Utility jobs tend to be very stable and long term. Uh, power plant employees receive retirement benefits, health insurance coverage, and paid leave, as well as a number, number of protections from the unions that represent them. Now to some key themes, and we'll start with key themes from interviews here. So you all saw in a previous slide how much the plants contribute in terms of tax revenue to local governments and schools. An important thing to recognize is that there are very few other businesses or facilities that would contribute similar revenues to the community. For example, it would take 143 Target big box stores, I couldn't quite fit that on the slide, but 143 Target stores to replace the tax revenues of the Prairie Island nuclear generating plant. It's also a rare business that would be able to provide so many jobs at such high wages and with good benefits. So these factors make it all the more difficult for communities to replace power plants. It's not as simple as attracting a couple average businesses. Another key theme that came out of our study is that while communities are concerned about the direct impacts of losing tax revenue and jobs, in most cases, they're actually more fearful or concerned about the potential cascading effects. For instance, communities worry that when power plant jobs are no longer available, people would all put up their homes for sale and move. And that could collapse the local housing market, reduce enrollment at local schools, and cause many of the local businesses that serve residents to go under. The prospect of losing power plant jobs and then those workers and families is also bigger than just a population loss. It's a potential loss to some of of some of the people who contribute the most to the social fabric of these communities. Many communities discussed how active power plant employees are in their community. They tend to be long-term residents who buy homes, raise their families within the community, and are often highly educated. They serve on boards for local organizations, they volunteer, and they contribute to local charities and nonprofits. Additionally, utility owners contribute a lot to the communities as well. They invest in local nonprofits, local parks, local schools. They help staff events with volunteers. And so the prospect of losing the utility as a corporate partner is also a big area of concern. Though many of Minnesota's power plant communities receive great benefits from the plants they host, they also receive the negative aspects as well. And that has included noise pollution, um, the noise, as I understand it, has come down a lot, has been reduced, but historically these plants have been pretty loud. Um, air pollution and water pollution, much of that has also been reduced with modern pollution controls and regulation, but in a, the past these were daily concerns of local residents and they remain concerns today. And the potential for accidents and incidents that could threaten the community. 
So many other communities rejected power plants. Um, they're not necessarily attractive to all communities, but they are necessary for all communities to have power. And finally, an important theme that came from interviews, um, communities' concern about losing their power plant should not be interpreted as being against the environment. Communities who benefit from power plants also care about the environment. Um, some coal plant communities stated that they'd love to find a cleaner alternative, but they also acknowledged that finding a cleaner alternative that would provide the same level of tax revenue and the similar quality of jobs was hard to envision. One community called it the unicorn that they're seeking. Um, in some communities that we looked at for our national case studies, there was an adversarial relationship between the communities and the environmentalists or clean energy advocates. For Minnesota, that doesn't need to be the case. There can be common ground. And in fact, we saw a lot of common ground between those who are advocating for clean energy um, and the environment and those living in communities that benefit from the power plants they host. And in a lot of cases, these groups may overlap and actually include the same people. Now some themes that emerged from our community surveys. To jog your memory, we received just over 50 responses to the community survey across all of the partic participating communities. Um, the survey was targeted to a general audience of people living and working in power plant communities. 75 of percent of respondents said that they live within the host community and nearly 40% had a child or children enrolled in the local schools. When asked how people feel about the future of their community, over half of community members surveyed reported feeling concerned with about a third saying they felt optimistic. And I wanna note that this survey happened prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So that was not a factor in responses. Today, I'd imagine we'd see a much higher rate of those who are concerned. Um, these graphics, for those not familiar, take all the responses we received on a given survey question and the size of the word correlates to the frequency it was used. So here, jobs was the most common word used in response to the question, what does the power plant mean for your community? Other popular responses include taxes, power, stability, partner, reliable, and benefits. Here, the most popular response to the question, what concerns would you have if the power plant were to close were loss, jobs, tax base or taxes, employees and population loss. Sprinkled in there, you can also see people noted concerns about community engagement, contributions, home values and even power outages. The most popular response to the question, what vision do you have for your community's future were growth, downtown, families, schools, improvement and destination. And other interesting responses include partnerships, greater diversity, being sustainable and livable. Now quickly, some takeaways from our national case studies. We researched four national case studies, two coal plants and two nuclear plants. The Diablo Canyon power plant in California is a nuclear plant, Maine Yankee nuclear plant in Maine, and then for the coal plants, coal strip plant in Montana and Centralia in Washington. Um, we saw some of the most effective and productive outcomes in these case studies from bringing together a diverse range of affected stakeholders to collaboratively work on a transition plan. The stakeholders in these case studies included community members, local governments, local school districts, environmental organizations, utilities, regulators, and policymakers. These efforts take a long time, so early stakeholder engagement is best. Second, we saw that invest, investing in existing community assets can help to offset the impact of plant closures. Host communities have existing energy infrastructure like transmission and distribution infrastructure, existing expertise in their workforce and existing natural resources. These are great starting points for building out transition strategies. And in fact, many of our Minnesota communities are already working to leverage their own existing assets. 
And finally, certain characteristics of plant closures led to worse outcomes than others for communities. One big factor is how quickly a plant closes. In some unregulated states, power plants have closed almost overnight. We're lucky in Minnesota that our utility plants are regulated by the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, and so they're less likely to have an unexpected sudden closure. But that is a big factor. Another big challenge we saw were plants that have um, stored nuclear waste on site. The US does not have a permanent storage facility, and without federal action, nuclear waste typically stays wherever it was initially put. And that can severely limit uh, redevelopment options. Now quickly to our findings and conclusions. This may seem obvious, but it's important for everyone to understand the power plants included in this study have really been instrumental in helping to build many of the communities in which they're located. Power plants contribute directly to a community by providing stable, healthy tax base, um, utility contributions to local charities and nonprofits, and investments in infrastructure and commerce with local businesses that serve the plant. They contribute indirectly by attracting plant workers and their families and the businesses that serve those workers and families, the contributions that workers and families make to the community and the value that workers build through investments in their own homes and properties. The power plants included in this study also contribute to other nearby communities, as we noted, through those state aid programs. Uh, many of the Minnesota communities included in the study are proactively planning and preparing for the eventual retirement of the plants they host. These communities are currently deploying a number of different strategies to assist. Some, including the study, are investing to renew and revitalize their aging infrastructure now with the aim to pay those investments off before plants retire. Other communities are investing in infrastructure to attract new businesses, such as shovel-ready industrial parks, and actively working to recruit new businesses. Some communities have plans to develop recreational areas that highlight their natural assets and attract new visitors and tourists. The magnitude of the contributions that power plants make to communities, however, make them really challenging to replace. So none of these strategies alone, or perhaps even combined, are expected to fill the gap left by a retired plant. Economic development projects require significant time. They may require uh, planning and zoning changes, infrastructure investments, and long-term business recruitment or development efforts. Similarly, investing in and paying down debt for infrastructure renewal um, ahead of a power plant retirement requires significant time for planning, construction, and debt service. The earlier the communities can begin deploying these strategies ahead of retirements, the more likely it is that those strategies mature and provide benefits to the community in time for a plant retirement. Unknown, uncertain, or changing timelines for a power plant re retirement can make community and worker transition planning all the more difficult. When plant retirement timelines seem uncertain or unknown, it can be difficult to know how and when to select and implement effective transition strategies. And if a retirement date is accelerated, it may mean that certain transition plans and efforts won't be fully effective in time for the plant's closure. Additionally, uncertainty can affect how communities and workers respond to and prioritize the need for transition efforts. And uncertainty can also exacerbate anxiety and tension for communities and make it more difficult to reach agreement, build support for, and carry out effective transition strategies. Minnesota Utilities and the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission have to make resource decisions, including determining retirement dates, in response to changing plant economic and policy conditions. However, some uncertainty may be lessened by ongoing and open communication between the utility regulators, communities, unions, and workers. And in many ways, host communities and power plant workers face common issues and concerns around plant retirements. Yet, community transition efforts and worker transition efforts are often siloed from each other to some extent. Workers, labor unions, and host communities may find value in collaborating, coordinating, and supporting one another more throughout community and worker transition efforts. As we stated before, and labor union representatives noted through interviews, 
the high quality of power plant jobs and the difficulty, if not impossibility, of replacing those plant jobs with equal jobs or equal quality jobs is a major issue. It's critical that we think beyond just replacing the total number of jobs um, when a plant retires, and instead we have to consider the quality of the jobs available to the workers who are displaced. As more of Minnesota's and the nation's central power plants retire, jobs available in the electric sector will change. Far fewer permanent workers are needed for natural gas power plants and even fewer are required for renewable energy resources. As Minnesota transitions towards more renewable energy resources and natural gas generation, the total number of jobs in the electric generation sector will likely decline. And finally, the host community story is not a monolithic one. The Prairie Island Indian community's relationship to the power plant they host is significantly different from that of any other community in this study. Their relationship with the nuclear plant is rooted in decades of history, including how the plant came to be, the history of the land on which the plant sets, sits, and how the tribe was treated during construction and early operation of the plant. Today, the Prairie Island Indian community and Excel Energy have open communication and the relationship is as good as it's ever been. But that does not erase the community's memories or concerns. Despite the proximity to the plant, the Prairie Island Indian community does not receive tax revenue and no tribal members work at the plant. The nuclear plant and on-site fuel storage deters many community members from living on tribal land. And additionally, the nuclear plant is seen as a potential threat to the tribe's main source of revenue, the Treasure Island Resort and Casino. The Prairie Island Indian community would like to see the plant retired and the land restored to its previous condition and returned to tribal ownership, but they acknowledge this is unlikely and unrealistic until the spent fuel stored on site is removed. So next here, we're gonna go to a panel discussion where you'll get to hear from the real experts. There we go, things had paused for me, I apologize. Um, for our panel discussion, we have Greg Prezinski from Becker, uh, Max Peters from Cohasset, Jeff O'Neill from Monticello, Mayor Mary McCumber from Oak Park Heights. Um, just a note, unfortunately, Mayor McCumber will not be on video today, but she will be on audio and that's great. Um, we'll also have Heather Westra from the Prairie Island Indian Community, Mayor Sean Douts from Red Wing, and Marshall Halleck from Red Wing as well. So I'm gonna turn my camera off and you should be able to see all your panelists. I am also going to stop sharing my screen here. I apologize for talking my way through this, but it's a lot of operations that we have to, to keep going. All right, excellent. Hi, welcome everybody. You can see me, hear me. Um, I am gonna kick us off here with a question, but I would like to turn it over also to Brady to talk about how um, attendees can ask questions for you. Brady, do you wanna take that one? Sorry here, Audrey, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties. Did you want me to kick off with the first question? No, um, if you can just let people know how they can ask questions of the panelists. Oh, yeah, um, if you could just enter it into the question bar, um, I'm going to try to filter through and see if we're getting some similar questions. And then um, I will call on people to unmute themselves in the audience, um, or perhaps I can help them if they need that. Um, and then I'm going to ask that you say your question out loud to the group, and then our panelists can answer it. Great. And when you type in your question, if you would put in um, your name and title so that we know how to call upon you, that'd be great too. All right, my first question today we're gonna kick it off with is really broad. What does the power plant mean to your community? And I think we're gonna start with Greg Prusensky can introduce himself and his role, both at Becker and the Coalition of Utility Cities. Thank you, Audrey. Um, and thank you for everybody um, that's in attendance today. Um, 
just want to kind of give you a background. Uh, my name is Greg Prasinski. I'm the city administrator in Becker, and I'm also the president of the Coalition of Utility Cities. Um, the coalition is a partnership uh, among eight communities, Becker being one of them, White Lakes, Monticello, Oak Park Heights, Red Wing, Cohasset, Granite Falls, and Fergus Falls. Um, as you can imagine, we're all smaller communities. Um, our power plants, whether it's a nuke plant or a, a coal plant, um, large uh, impact on the community, whether that's um, taxpayer, um, employer, or philanthropic activities. And Audrey kind of went through some of those activities in her report. Um, the coalition, uh, we came to be about 20 years ago um, as kind of a think tank. Um, communities that host these large scale uh, power plants um, have unique um, uh, issues that come up periodically like decommissioning. Um, and we think it is a good way to meet those challenges, a group um, with similar problems and we can do troubleshooting together. Um, the coalition, I would like to say, exists for many different reasons, some of which um, to educate legislators, um, to assist communities through transitions like we're going through now, study those transitions, economic and social impacts. Um, and then also uh, we have a, a, a voice at the legislature um, and we've worked on tax issues. We've worked on transition issue, issues. Audrey mentioned uh, local government aid, which is probably one of those issues that's coming up um, in the not too distant future. Um, so Audrey, your question, what does the plant mean to, um, to the community? You know, you, you already mentioned several of them, tax base, probably number one, number two, uh, jobs. Um, number three, uh, all those philanthropic activities in Becker, we have a golf course. We have for many years partnered with our local Sherco plant. Um, they do an annual, uh, golf tournament at our, at our course, um, they raise thousands of dollars, 60, 70, $80,000 for, for one day of activity um, for the United Way. Um, they also have a, a strong presence in our local school. Um, again, not just the tax base part of it, but for years they've had uh, different programs like um, internships for our students. Um, a lot of our local people work there. Uh, local businesses, I'll, I'll just point to one, we've got, um, local hardware store and I know the owner of that of that store has commented to me many times the number of times that people from that local power plant visit his his store to buy whatever it happens to be I mean it's just an economic hub um, I know there's a, a, a regional significance um, the power plant you know it's 300 jobs so it's just a it's a it's a huge presence in Becker Great, thank you so much, Greg. I think next, can we go to Max Peters at Cohasset? It, you know, when I start to think of what Boswell means to Cohasset, I, I, it starts with high quality jobs and taxes and, and really comes back to allowing this community to have the capacity to do projects that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Great. Right. Do you want to mention a couple of those projects? I know you guys have some really um, cool projects that are ongoing. Yeah, I mean, so I've been with the community for uh, just over seven years. Um, the, our first big one was uh, an industrial park expansion. Um, you know, our, over a 15 year period, our phase one industrial park had filled up um, and we, we were able to expand that to another 350 acres. Um, which allowed us to uh, attract uh, Lake Country Power, their corporate headquarters. Um, they purchased 25 acres. It was a $12 million project, uh, 70,000 square foot facility and, and 65 jobs to this community. Um, the thing, you know, project like that wouldn't have been able to, to be achieved um, you know, without some of that, that capacity. I think some of the other things that we're working on that are exciting, um, we just built out the Tioga Recreation uh, Mountain Bike Trail Facility. So if people are familiar with, with Cuyuna and the things that are happening in Crosby, um, we're part of you know three projects across the Iron Range, um, supported in, in part by 
by IRRRB funds as well. Um, you know, that it, it has an amazing opportunity for, for recreation and, and economic impact. Um, we're also working on a, a community funded daycare facility. So we're, we're connected to our, um, our local, keeping our local elementary school in Cohasset. Um, we we um, invested money into expansion of the, of the gymnasium uh, into an 84 slot daycare facility and a community center co-located with that elementary school. Um, I, the, our, our kind of next big project, uh, we purchased 40, 40 acres on the Mississippi River and are looking at a, a hotel downtown um, um, development. So you're thinking about a marina and a boardwalk, hotel, restaurants, retail, um, potential long-term housing, condo, apartment um, units. So those are kind of a, a you know a handful of projects that are, that we work on and that we get to really pursue because we we have that that capacity that comes from you know keeping our tax base you know bearable for our for our residents and, and businesses um, you know and and allowing us to move beyond just the defensive um, perspective of managing and running a city um, to moving you know offensively and trying to pursue. Um, significant economic development opportunities. Great, thanks, Max. Um, can we move to Mayor McCumber? I know we can't see you, but we'd love to hear from you. I could see you. Um, what the plant, the King plant, means to to our city? It's been here since the '60s. Um, it's been a really the the people at the King plant are really good partners. Um, Brian Bain is the plant manager there now, and um, previous plant managers, and Colette Urich um, from the East Metro office, have been really good to work with our city on um, issues that come up and opportunities as well. Um, several years ago, when the fly ash um, storage area was capped, um, XL worked with the city to turn that into a park. And, you know, they put in the trail ahead of time and they were cooperative when we wanted to build a playground there and came up with some long um, term planning. And then a couple of years ago, they did a prairie restoration project with, you know, bringing back habitat. Um, obviously, we have the same issues as Max and, and Greg just said is the tax capacity for our city. And it just doesn't affect just the city. It, you know, a certain portion goes to, um, as Audrey said earlier, the fiscal disparities and then also the county. And then we also host the Stillwater Area High School and the schools will lose when the plant is closed too. So it's, it's pretty broad. And as Greg had mentioned, we do not get local government aid at this time because we do host the power plant. So the city has been working really hard um, on coming up with ideas. Uh, where do we go from here? And we've assembled a an advisory panel, um, about 25 stakeholders with a really good collaboration of, of different groups, including Excel, um, trying to plan ahead for what is gonna happen when the plant is gone, as opposed to waiting until you know 2028 when, when the doors are closed. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And then we'll go over to Monticello, to Jeff O'Neill. Okay, thank you. Um, well, what does the, the power plant mean to our community, Monticello? I mean, I know a lot of uh, the subjects have been touched on already, so I won't re repeat too much, but I guess the thing that really uh, have to mention is just the influence and positive impact on the community that just stems from the great people that work at the plant. I mean, they're highly skilled, they're energized, they're forward-looking, they're intelligent, um, they're really engaged in the community in a lot of ways, um, both individually on various school district um, initiatives with, with various schools, the city, town, county boards, and their commissions, um, the volunteer groups, the Lions Clubs, the Rotary Club, and so on. Uh, and then just the, the individuals and the, the, the group itself that work at the local plant, they, they work together on different projects, pollinator, pollinator planning projects, prairie restorations, and river cleanup projects. So they're just a very strong um, a segment of our, of our culture and our community. And it's, it's, it's been many years in the making, but it's the thought of the, those staff people eventually uh, moving on um, 
would really leave a huge void and uh, we need to plan for that though because someday it's it's coming. Um, one also mentioned the trust that I think the community has. You know, we, we do accept the risk of having a nuclear plant. Not many cities would want one, um, but now that it's here and that we know the people so well and the work they do, huge level of confidence in Excel that they're operating in a safe and um, responsible fashion. So um, the, the, the staff, the culture, that's created with the with the community and the employees i think that is that really means a lot to the community of course the the tax base of course goes without saying uh, monticello has not historically exploited that tax base we still have a very low tax base or tax rate um, but we have invested i think wisely to do some things to create some additional amenities great park system we have a community center and we've done some things to make our our town a great place to to live in. So a lot of that is to the credit and we're going to uh, to excel in the presence of the plant in our community. That's all I have for that question. Thanks, Jeff. And then we'll go over to Red Wing to Mayor Douse and Marshall Halleck. Hi, thank you. Uh, I, want, I want to lead, out, lead off by uh, talking about the tax base, uh, the XL uh, nuclear gener generating plant provides city of Red Wing. Uh, as Audrey uh, has said, it's about 54%. And with that 54%, which came uh, because of uh, some major investment uh, Excel made into the power plant, we've been able to leverage that 54% into invest investing in infrastructure, major investments in infrastructure around the city. It's, it's uh, enabled us to provide good roads parks and trails, roofs on city buildings, uh, a, a renovation of the Barn Bluff uh, uh, um, uh landmark in Red Wing, uh, and trails throughout the community and to redo our riverfront area. So it, it's been a major infusion of infrastructural improvement in the city of Red Wing. And I have to mention, again, the 600 jobs that Excel provides, and that's uh, regular uh, week to week, year to year, but frequently there are outages at the plant when they do upkeep and maintenance, and that is an additional 1,400 to 1,600 jobs during those periods. Uh, and folks have uh, uh, talked about the impact of the employees uh, on the culture and the social fabric of, uh, of their cities, and that's absolutely true for Red Wing. Uh, I was I was at a meeting at 7:30 this morning uh, of Every Hand Joined, which is a collective impact uh, organization in Red Wing, to look at uh, how the school's performing and take certain benchmarks in the school performance and outcomes, such as third grade reading scores and how they measure within the city, uh, communities of color uh, relative to uh, the state of Minnesota. And our leader uh, at that meeting today was Excel's manager of community relations and economic development. And he's taking us through a, a critical transition in that organization, which will have huge impact relative to schools and uh, they're uplifting our students in this community. So it's a huge impact in Red Wing from jobs, tax base to the folks that are working out there and are working in our community. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Marshall, did you want to add anything or should I move on? Yeah, I'll just quickly state, I think the study does a really good job of capturing a lot of the benefits and a lot of the uh, concerns and costs that come with hosting these plants. But I also want to point out that in uh, these rural greater Minnesota areas that these facilities are unique. They have a massive presence that permeates every aspect of the community, every aspect of the community. And more to the point now, we're during these times of energy transi transition, excuse me, I think a few of the things that stick out in our mind that we're trying to pay attention to is as your, as your slide captured, that uncertainty ahead, the, the great amount of uncertainty that's been interjected to all of our long-term planning processes. This is um, something relatively new, something the city struggles to deal with, something we are taking head, 
head on, as the mayor mentioned, making um, significant investments in, in infrastructure to ensure our future success. But I also want to mention that some of the facilities, um, some of the other struggles we have with the facilities are really the long-term legacy stigma effects, if you will, of hosting um, dry cast or spent nuclear fuel for an indefinite permanent period of time into the future. As you stated earlier, there is no um, discernible federal plan for addressing the storage of spent nuclear fuel and it's something that we um, participate in solving and are keenly interested in. And I'll leave it at that. But thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Marshall. And now last we're going to go to Heather Westra with Prairie Island Indian Community. And I save you for last, Heather, not because you are any less important, but because your perspective is so unique and different. Uh oh, um, Heather, we're not getting your audio. Um, someone help us here. Are you okay, unmuted? I'm unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Okay, good. I'm not not too cool with this technology. So, uh, thank you, Audrey and Brady. We're very pleased to have been part of this. Um, and as you stated, Prairie Island is a very unique host community. Um, Prairie Island Indian community shares many of the same concerns that other host communities do, but our perspective is, is quite different from the other host communities. But um, I've been working for the tribe for almost 26 years, mainly on power plant and spent fuel issues. And it's, it's very refreshing to be part of a study um, from the get-go with the other host communities because oftentimes we are left out because it's not a host community in the traditional sense, such as the tax base and the jobs. So our, our, our impacts are different. Uh, but getting back to your original question of what the power plant means to the community. And, you know, I think, and as you mentioned it, I, I need to say this right up front, you know, we now have a pretty good relationship with um, XL Energy, but that wasn't always the case. And so I think over the years, there's been an overall negative um, perspective or viewpoint. Um, the risk factor is, is high for many people. They, they see they're bearing the greatest risk, but not getting the benefit. I think fear um, is, is a big component for many people. They, the unknown, how, how the technology works. Could there be an accident? What would happen to our community? Um, and I think one of the biggest um, impacts or perspectives is a betrayal by the federal government um, on the part of the Prairie Island Indian community. When that plant was built, there was nobody who came in and said, why should that plant be so close to an Indian community? The Bureau of Indian Affairs should have been looking out for the community, they didn't. Department of Interior should have been looking out for the community, and they didn't. We can't go back in time and unsite the plant, but nevertheless, that's there's there are long-standing um, concerns that haven't been haven't quite gone away uh, with regard to the federal government and why that plant was sited there from the beginning, so close to a federally recognized Indian community. And I just need to say that the federal government through its agencies like the Bureau of Indian Affairs as part of the Department of Interior has a uh, trust obligation to ensure that the rights, the health, the safety, the well-being of an Indian community is protected and, and they didn't do that. So that's, that's kind of the uh, answer to that question, if you will. Thank you, Heather. And thank you for being a part of the study. I think it was really helpful um, and it, it rounded out, you know, the, the, sto the story of the plant. Um, I am going to turn it over to Brady real quick and see what sorts of questions we're getting from the audience. Brady, do you have any that um, audience members have sent to you? Or would you yeah, I've got a few and I would just um, encourage people to chime in too with new questions um, as you think of them. Um, I've got one, um, Audrey, I think you might be able to even answer and then 
um, communities, and maybe Shane can jump in. Um, it's from uh, Kira, and it says, I work at the National Assessment of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, and I'm curious about what role you see the Minnesota PUC taking in managing the impacts of retirements. Well, um, Brady, if you could unmute Kira, and then so she we may have left, but I can see oh. if she's there. Okay. Um, I think, you know, maybe we just take this. I saw her question. It was fairly specific, but maybe we can just do a little round robin here um, for our community members. What do you all see as a positive, productive, and helpful role for you all um, from the PUC? Obviously, they're the regulators that have to determine retirement dates. Um, but how could you see them being helpful to you all as they go through that process? And I'm going to go in the same order unless you all want to mix it up a little bit. And we'll just start with Greg. Sure, I, I can say a couple of things to that point. Um, and I think I'll start back when um, Sherco and the conversation started about decommissioning units one and two. Um, early on, my sense was anyway, that there wasn't a lot of conversation and maybe some folks um, at that level weren't really thinking about impact to host communities. Um, so we really amped up our game um, when they started talking about the resource plan and decommissioning um, through the coalition um, and, and others and some of the collaborations that we put together, we were able to you know, talk a little bit more in depth about the social um, economic impact of, of decommissioning these plants. Um, I think the, you know, moving forward, I think they're a lot more sensitive to it. Um, I think they're they're starting to, to see um, uh, see the world through our lens, if you will, um, a little bit different perspective. But I think they're starting to understand that it's going to be not just the Public Utility Commission, but it's also going to be the legislature and the governor's office and all these other entities that help these host communities transition away from a um, a coal plant in our in our case. I'll turn it over to some of the other folks for comments. Max, do you wanna you wanna start and then we can? Um... Yeah, I would. I would tend to agree with with Greg. I thought you know, and it's an interesting perspective in that you know it's it's not a monolith. There's there's five votes. Um, you know, in our stakeholder meetings, uh, it's been really interesting the the diversity of perspective. I think you have some people that um, on, on that. Uh, Commission that really understand the impacts to the community and and have a, a, a sense of even respect for that. Um, but there's also a, a, at least a couple members who I would say don't, and uh, you know their their concerns are are not how it affects the community or how it impacts you know communities that might be a little bit more unique and different. You know, I mean, for instance, when you look at Cohasset, what that power plant means to to a a rural, small rural community, um, what that means to our industries of, of iron mining and, and paper manufacturing. Um, you know, those are um, uh, those are significant por portions of our, um, you know, our livelihood that are different that from other places where we're much more dependent on some of those industries um, as opposed to being closer to, say, the, the Twin Cities, that, that hub area. Um, so I really think it's it's getting them to to understand and and see us as as unique and and understand what you know how we we fit into those equations and and you know the decisions that they have to make regarding you know plant closure or early plant closure or or even you know extensions uh, of life. Um, so I think that's that that impact piece for them I think is. It's a there's some diversity there, but I it, it was interesting to hear the how some people were very supportive and understood, and how some people, did, you know, a few of them didn't. Great, Mayor McCumber, do you want to add to that? Uh, sure. Um, I thought found it very valuable to have a seat at the table, if you will, um, during the integrated resource plan study over the last year, year and a half, whatever it is. Um, 
obviously the integrated resource plan was meant to look at clean energy alternatives and how the plants would be closed and moving that way. But there's also a cause and effect from doing that. And it was very valuable to, for all of us to be, have that opportunity to speak up on behalf of our plants in our cities and, and how that's gonna play out in the future. And then the study that we just finished with the CEE um, really highlighted more, um, more intently, if you will, you know, how it's gonna affect our schools, how it's gonna affect the jobs, how it's gonna affect our communities. So by having all that integrated in with the resource plan, I think it's very um, gonna be very enlightening to legislators. And I think it was to the panel that, was, that we were all at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and now to Red Wing. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, things that would help us is that right now, uh, uh, as we know, Excel has a huge impact on the community and what we're living with, uh, as Marshall indicated, is huge uncertainty and ambiguity about what the future holds. The The two plants here in Red Wing, uh, uh, license ends in uh, 2034 and 2035. Uh, the Excel could apply to have those re-extended it would be really helpful to know how we remove the uncertainty going forward about whether that would be granted or not under what criteria that the PUC might uh, bring to bear on that decision and come to a conclusion sooner or later on uh, the, how they want to proceed on that sort of uh, removing the uncertainty out of the future. And into Monticello. I don't have a lot to add. I think uh, I concur with what everyone said, but I just kind of want to re reiterate that our host communities provided uh, power and provided uh, host community services to our, our big uh, plants for all these years dutifully. And we're all excited about the energy transition. I think we all support environmental change that's needed. But as that shift occurs and as all the entire state benefits from that shift, that those loyal host communities are um, kept in uh, kept made whole, or at least there's consideration of our change that we're going through as the whole state benefits from this change as it occurs. So, and I commend uh, uh, kind of Greg for leading the charge a little bit on that and, and the Coalition Utility Cities as we uh, make our voices heard at the uh, Key Integrated Resource Plan. I really appreciate that, the way the PUC has um, managed that process and appreciated the chance to be able to make comments through that process. So it's pretty much all I have on that one. Thanks, Jeff. And Heather, you want to wrap us up here? Sure. Am I on? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, I think with respect to the PUC, um, I think one of the best things that could come out of this is just increasing the awareness um, regarding the proximity of the power plant to the Prairie Island Indian community. I mean, it's quite possible that there are commissioners that have no idea or staff that have no idea that the power plant is so close to the community. So that's that's one good thing. But I think as, as Mayor Dowds mentioned, the uncertainty regarding uh, the possibility of license extension, um, while it's not a public utilities commission decision, um, it would be nice to maybe see some kind of indication whether or not that may be pursued with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, just so everyone is is kind of aware that this is on the horizon. And I understand that it's not going to be addressed until the next integrated resource plan. So that does give us some time to think about it, but it would be better to know sooner rather than later. Audrey, could I mention one thing? Awesome. This is Marshall. I, I think um, it's it's clear. It's evidently clear that the PUC is a partner in this in this um, in these kind of key decisions, and and that they're broad and they're becoming much more inclusive um, in their process. Whether that's instructing through the IRP process to host uh, to have Excel host uh, stakeholder meetings, uh, a, a more it, previously it had been a struggle to get a seat at the table. And, you, and the struggle came at immense cost to the uh, taxpayers to participate in that process. Um, clearly, much more inclusive now. Um, obviously, uh, more thought being given to the circumstances of our communities. 
uh, that's a active part of the um, docket um, information about impacts on host communities. Uh, so we're happy to see that you know they broaden their perspective, broaden the participation, been more inclusive, and we continue to look forward to uh, working with the PUC as we move and march through this entire process. Thanks, Marshall. I, I just will add one thing onto this. Um, many of you guys actually already know this, that the PUC reached out to us to talk more about the issues that were highlighted in the report that we're discussing today. So I agree with you, Marshall, this you know hasn't probably been um, top of mind historically as people or as the commissioners and previous commissioners um, have had to weigh resource decisions, but certainly this current commission seems more interested in learning more about these issues and understanding how they can um, can help communities and address community needs even if you know plants have to retire um, there still may be things that the commission can do to make those retirements um, more go more smoothly for for communities brady i think you got a question from um, the audience that you wanted to share. Yeah, I'm going to unmute um, Lauren Salberg. It sounds like she might have a good question. Lauren, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, you can just read the question. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, what have the companies done to invest in environmental issues and improve the performance of the plants in most communities? Great. Uh, Greg, you want to start with that? Or if Greg, if you'd like to, we can also kick it over to the utilities who should be on the line. Yeah, let's kick it over to the utilities. <laughs> okay. Um, John Marshall, are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, I am, Audrey. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate the question and I, I do want to just offer a quick bit of thanks to our, our host communities um, for their work in the last uh, 18 months with respect to this study and, and certainly for CEE uh, for great work in, in facilitating this, this work. I appreciate the kind comments. Um, certainly this culture of collaboration uh, we see very much moving forward uh, as, as the years come forward and this transition comes to, to be realized. Specific to the question of of what investments have been made with respect to, I believe it was environmental, uh, is it per community or overall as a company? Was there clarity on that, Brady? I think it's in regard to the power plants themselves. Well, certainly. Um, um, yeah, the, the plants not uh, being included in this study, we can look back um, a little over a decade uh, to our, our Merck project, and there were significant environmental investments there uh, at our Oak Park Heights King plant. Uh, so actually that plant is part of this study um, and there was significant investments uh, made there about a decade ago. Um, additional investments in the plants uh, today. Um, I can't speak to specifics there with respect to uh, what, what dollars are being made. I, I might actually call on Chris Shaw to see if he has any subject matter expertise. Otherwise, uh, we can provide some written response with additional details on each of these plants if that would be helpful. Hey, John, will you um, just tell us what MRP is? Because a lot of people are probably not familiar with that acronym. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, MRP is an acronym speaking to the Metro Emissions Reduction Project. And this was a three plant uh, investment project uh, that involved the St. Paul Highbridge plant, the Minneapolis uh, Riverside facility. Both of those were converted from coal to natural gas. Uh, and then significant capital investments at the Oak Park Heights plant, the King plant, uh, that uh, included significant investments in a bag house and another a bunch of additional environmental investments to reduce SOX and NOx. Uh, MERP was a, I think, a very successful story as we look back in, in the not too distant past uh, and a good success story of collaboration and partnership and certainly environmental investment. Uh, MERP is, there's quite a bit of published papers out there talking about that uh, project, the environmental be benefits that were seen from that significant reductions throughout that project of SOX, NOx, mercury, uh, and carbon. Um, and it does actually speak a little bit to this uh, mission of collaboration that is echoed throughout this call and, and, and certainly in this whole process with all of the host communities. Um, I, I was actually involved quite a bit with the Highbridge project 
um, once converted, there was a significant amount of remaining open land. And that was a very involved process uh, involving just a lot of stakeholders. The city wasn't the single stakeholder. You start to peel the onion back and understand the variabilities of opinions and thoughts from neighborhood groups, communities, different river stakeholders. There's a lot of um, opinions about what that future use might entail that really is uh, important to involve a lot of folks. There were visions down there for soccer fields, for community gardens, um, a senior walking trail. There was a police stable being considered for the police mounted patrol, a lot of opinions. So as we talk about the future and opportunities like say uh, King Plant, and I know Mayor Mary and, and that city is now leading a nice collaboration to explore economic development out there. Um, understanding what that future vision is, what the desires of the community, the county, is it tax base, uh, is it public uh, green space or active space? There's just a lot of variables. So again, echoing the sentiment of collaboration and our commitment to that um, is, is uh, really encouraging here moving forward and, and Excel Energy just want to affirm on this call our continued uh, commitment to keep working closely and, and, and collaborate with our communities and, and our, our tribal council down at Prairie Island. Thanks, Audrey, John. this is Mary. Can I get on to um, John's comment? Uh, when yes. he said that they did the significant work at King Plant, and it's, I think it is about 10 years ago, um, put in the pollution control equipment and changed a lot of things out. And it did greatly reduce the particulates that were going in the air. It didn't eliminate everything, but there has been reduction in it. Thank you, Mayor. And I know Max Peters from Cohasset, you you spoke about that as well, that Minnesota Power um, invested quite a bit in some um, recent pollution controls. So if you want to add yeah, anything. They, they had just re, um, finished a project of $500 million to um, add pollution control controls, um, you know, NOx, SOx reductions. I mean, they're, the, the mercury reduction was you know 200 plus pounds a year to less than 20. Um, you know we like to say here that we've got the cleanest coal-fired power plant in the world which still a coal-fired power plant and still burning carbon but you know I, I think that the it as I've been here and and understood that these challenges it's been interesting to see you know when you think of Minnesota Power and their fleet in 2004 they were five percent renewable 95 percent carbon you know, next year they'll be 50% renewable, 50% carbon. Um, you know, and and back to some of the challenges is 74% of of their power um, goes to 12 major industrial companies. So th this it, it's a it's a different consideration than I think you know even with it between Minnesota Power and Excel and Boswell versus these other facilities. Um, but you know, I I think that's the part where I I feel like Minnesota Power has been a, a Pretty fantastic steward when it's come to making those improvements and making those investments. Obviously, some of them have been mandates, but um, but I think that it, you know there there is a question that I've always had is you know what, what when do you get credit for all the work that you've actually done? Um, you know wh when do we when does that you know business and and the investments that they've made into that facility you know matter matter for something? Um, you know I recognize maybe the answer is never unless it's you know 100% renewable. Um, but I feel like that's a, it, it's an interesting part of that conversation and equation. Thank you, Max. Does anybody else want to add on to that one? If not, I think, um, Brady, do you want to ask another question or would you like for me to move to, to my next set? Um, we're, uh, we don't have many from the audience, Audrey, so I think if you want to go to your next set, I think that would work great. Excellent. So I want to ask all of you, um, and briefly here, what role do you expect the utility to play in the transition before and after the plant shutdown? What do you see the utility doing throughout this? And we can start with Greg. Sure. So, um, Remember, units one and two in Becker have already been scheduled for decommissioning 2023 and 2026. So um, I guess we're starting, we're living the expectations right now. Um, I'll just kind of go through some of the things that we've been working on um, as a collaboration. And there are other stakeholders that are participating as well. But um, I guess one of the key elements 
that we're working on with Excel Energy in Becker is how can we use some of the buffer property that surrounds the Sherco plant? Um, you know, the, the plant will be decommissioning. Um, there's a fair amount of buffer property. Can we leverage that for uh, business development? Um, those conversations started years ago now, um, and we're just now starting to bring that to fruition. You know, we've got the possibility for a large data center. Uh, we've got a large recycling center that's up and running now. Um, those two projects are on um, former uh, Excel Energy property. Um, we've collaborated with uh, with uh, Ener uh, Excel Energy and BNSF on a um, rail impact study. Um, I I guess to cut to the to the to the answer, um, Audrey, um, a a partner that just doesn't uh, pick up their equipment and leave, and and they haven't done that. They've um, they've sat down with us. Um, we've we've been able to um, have some successes. Um, we are very happy with the way that they've been participating, and it's not just Excel Energy. It's Excel Energy, you know, the city. BNSF, the county has been a great partner. Um, just to be listening, active, follow through, um, and they and they've done all of that the last um, three or four years, whatever it's been. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, Max, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, you know, I think, and it's interesting as we start to walk down this path of, you know, we've we've already had, we've already decommissioned. You know Boswell units one and two, um, and we're you know really now starting to feel some of those effects from a tax perspective, um, and you know the and tax, both taxes and jobs. Um, I, you know I think as a as a partner where they've really added to me a lot of value is is being proactive about communicating um, with the city. So you know the general manager from the from the facility called the mayor and the economic development contact. You know. Uh, called me before you know before they do you know press releases and you know even trying to work together to say you know how can what what can we do as a city to help support you and you know if there's anything that you can do for us that you know that that kind of collaborative uh, relationship you know but it but it really becomes interesting as we start to walk down this process and and see in the future a time when Boswell 3 and 4 are, are not here um, you know it's the conversations with them about what does what opportunities are there for set that facility when it's gone, which really starts for us to to open up the other stakeholders and partners that that we need to have uh, better uh, you know relationships with, and even leaning on the ones that we have you know it, like the CUC. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for Coalition Utility Cities, I think the City of Cohasset would struggle trying to connect with legislatures and St. Paul. And and that, as we see it moving forward, is is one of the most um, important relationships that we have to develop and come up with ways ways to manage around some of those issues. You know, sp specifically when you look at LGA, we received zero dollars LGA, and if we were to lose our power plant tomorrow, I think the next year it, it would ramp up to a whole whopping amount of eight thousand dollars. So you know, they've got you know kind of controls in place to that it you know it can't rise or, or drop you know certain percentages or certain amounts that's great for people that have been part of that program but what about people who are would be just you know starting that program for the first time um and another example is I, you know i task a county you know our, our county counterparts we do not have a good relationship with that group but this is through this process in minnesota power you know that that's a the magnitude of the importance to the county is is significant as well. So it actually allows us to to work together and extend some olive branches to start, you know, softening some of those those relationships. So it, it really is interesting how the stakeholder partnerships, you know, change and and the different importance of of each one and you know how we how we manage those moving forward. Thanks, Max. Mayor McCumber, do you want to chime in on this one? I'll go back to talking about the um, study that we're going to be doing with every with the different groups. And Excel has been really receptive to being a partner in, in that study. There are so many unknowns when the plant closes. Um, 
we have a new, unique issue with where the plant is that it, it, it is adjacent to the wild and scenic river which is protected and how can something be redeveloped there so there's going to be work with the park service um, there's also the issue with the railroad which we all have um, i also have enjoyed having um, meetings they're usually quarterly breakfast meetings with the plant manager and the east metro manager um, just to talk about different issues that are going on there being kept up to date with when they're doing their maintenance, their shutdowns. Um, and I also appreciate John Marshall reaching out often um, when there's different tax issues where we didn't have that communication at one time. So it has improved so much better over the years. And I continue, I'm looking forward to continuing working with them. There, as I said, we'll probably get a lot of the questions answered as we start moving through this advisory panel. Um, but it's the question of what can go there, what is their timeline for removing the plant so it doesn't sit like some other plants that have sat, you know, sat for 15 years or whatever before they tear it down. We need to get some idea of replacing, obviously we're never going to replace that total tax value, but trying to get to a median of um, what is acceptable to everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. And now I think we'll go to um, Jeff Monticello, then Red Wing and Heather. And just to let all the panelists know, I think this will probably end up being our last question. Okay, from the Monticello perspective, uh, we've had a, a really good experience over the years working with uh, the local um, staff at the, at the power plant. Um, we have quarterly meetings and we we get uh, good information on what's happening in the short term and then what are some of the uh, uh, things to be aware of long term. So we have a nice uh, ongoing dialogue, but uh, some of the things we want to talk about in the future where Excel can really help out uh, Monticello is just how are we going to uh, uh, work together in utilizing some of the land up towards where the nuclear power, power plant currently exists, which is also adjacent to I-94. So, uh, Excel is going to be involved um, as a partner as far as improving transportation access to that area because they have land in the vicinity and there's a vested interest uh, for development of that land in the future. So just kind of creating that um, foundation for development of new manufacturing, new industrial, new warehousing opportunities to, to tie into the, to the freeway access. Excel is going to be a partner with us in that in the future. I have some confidence that um, we'll be doing some joint planning in those in those areas and um, so just that the joint planning land use transportation are key um, areas where uh, the city and um, and excel can work together and creating an environment for um, new development to take place take the place of, of the power plant as it sunsets in years to come the other thing too is a uh, dry cast storage i know excel is working hard um, the federal government has not done anything to um, create repository for the spent waste, but I know Excel is working and trying to figure out other methods to transport it to for, for um, storage at a, a, a private company um, versus a federal storage. So that is in the offing, and I just uh, hopefully those efforts come to uh, some fruition here in the in the next few years. Thanks, Jeff. Over to to Red Wing, Sean, and Marshall. Well, uh, I would echo, echo what uh, Jeff just said uh, on many, many counts. The, we are, and we hope to continue to have a really close relationship with Excel. We meet quarterly, if not more often, with officials from Excel about what's going on at the plant, what's going on in the community, what's happening at the federal and state level relative to getting the spent nuclear fuel uh, uh, deposited safely somewhere in a, some temporary site and hopefully a future permanent site. Uh, and as we approach uh, the uh, shutdown of plants, I would hope that uh, they would continue to be a really close partner in developing plans uh, to help replace revenue uh, as well as uh, 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 how to convert uh, the plant site into a place where maybe after all the nuclear fuel is gone and all the stuff's gone, maybe get that uh, land so that it goes back to the Prairie Island Indian community where it started. So that's what I hope to see going forward. Thank you, Mayor Dallas. 
Marshall, did you want to add on or should we move to? Um, I think in the interest of time, my colleagues have summed it up extremely well and I'm, I want to defer or leave time for Heather and the Prairie Island Indian community. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Marshall. All right, Heather, you have thank the you last Marshall. word. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I mean, the plant could be shutting down in 13 or 14 years or 23 and 24 years, depending on whether or not it's relicensed for 10 years. And, um, you know, all indications are that that's a very strong possibility given Excel's um, carbon reduction goals. So we would expect um, that we would continue working together closely like we do currently, as the others have mentioned, to better understand the decommissioning process, how long it can possibly take. Uh, there are a number of cultural sites within the owner-controlled land, and so we would not want those disturbed during the decommissioning process, so we would want to be working closely with them uh, as, as that happens. And we would hope that once the property is released, for other uses that we that the Prairie Island Indian community would be offered the first opportunity to, to buy it or receive it in some way. And as others have mentioned, the spent fuel issue remains probably for the nuclear uh, communities a top priority. We don't know how long it's going to be there. Once the once the plant goes away and the spent fuel pool goes away, how will casks be changed out if something were to happen? That's a concern, um, and I know that Excel will continue to advocate for the fuel removal um, as we do with City of Red Wing and others uh, across the country to make sure that the government lives up to its responsibility to remove, remove the fuel um, per the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. So, but the stranded fuel is probably the number one issue for the Prairie Island Indian community uh, with respect to decommissioning. Thank you, Heather. Audrey, Audrey, yes. this is Mary. Could I add one one little thing? Um, yes. I'd like to thank the I'd like to thank CEE for putting this study together. I find it is a really good tool. Many of us have gone to testify before the House or Senate um, Energy Committees, and there's many who really don't understand what the impact is to our communities when these plants close. So thank you for putting that together. Um, and helping all of us out. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you all for participating in this study. It was such a wonderful project to be a part of, and I know Brady feels the same way. Um, thank you for being here today and for telling your stories. Thank you to all of the attendees for sticking with us. We had almost 80 people stay through this whole thing, and we had many more on it throughout. Um, thank you to the utilities for helping and for participating. Um, thank you to everybody. Everyone have a wonderful, sunny, beautiful day. I hope it's nice as it is here, wherever you all are. And we will look forward to continuing this conversation and continuing this work. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Brady. Thank you, Audrey. Thank, 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 thank you all. That's all. Bye. Bye-bye.